One of the key things I picked up from Casey's book is to not focus on winning. The reality is most people we speak to aren't gonna go vegan on the spot and we have very little control over this. I found by removing that single interaction focus has taken a load of weight off me and my interactions flow much more naturally as a result. Bruce Lee has a great quote that summarizes this. He said, the great mistake is to anticipate the outcome of the engagement. You ought not be thinking of whether it ends in victory or defeat. Let nature take its course and your tools will strike at the right moment. So let's not worry about who's gonna win and who's gonna lose, but let those conversations flow naturally. Have you ever felt shame in your life? How did it make you feel? Did it make you wanna engage more on the topic or did it make you wanna withdraw and perhaps do the exact opposite? Shame is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. If we want someone to do the exact opposite of what we're talking about, probably the way to go about it is to shame them. Now in psychology, there's a concept known as the shame response. I'll let Casey explain it further. But just by being a vegan, other people can feel guilt or shame. How many of you in the room have just told somebody you were vegan and got a really defensive response in the other person? Raise your hand. Who are saying, for example, well, I don't eat animals that much, or I only eat humane meat, or I'm cutting down, or I don't eat chickens anymore, or that, that kind of stuff. Um, and, or sometimes they get even more hostile and they'll say something like, well, you think you're better than me, don't you? Or, or they'll start to bully or tease you in various ways. So there's a lot of, a lot of head nods going on right now. Veganism is a triggering subject. Just our mere presence may make people feel shame. Chances are if you've been vegan for a while, you've already seen someone exhibit the shame response. We'll get more into how to watch for the shame response and what to do about it in the strategy section. It's not always easy being vegan in a pre-vegan world. But like, where do you get your protein from? Wow, I could never do it. Our outlook not only affects the way we interact with others, but our own mental well-being. That's why I like to view others as pre-vegans. Now I've had hundreds of interactions with members of the public, and I honestly believe every person I've spoken to has a possibility to embrace veganism. Now by viewing others as pre-vegans, not only does it give us hope for the world, but it will help us to find those positive seeds to water in our interactions. Now to help us with this, I'd like to engage us in a little bit of a thought experiment. Imagine there are two wolves in a fight. One is good, one is evil. Which wolf do you think wins? Do you think the good wolf wins? Or do you think the bad wolf wins? The answer is the wolf that wins is the wolf that we feed. So when we're out there interacting with others, let's look at others as pre-vegans and feed the good wolf. What do you think, Dexter? Are you a good wolf? One thing I've incorporated in my advocacy is being solution focused. People are much more drawn to the positive potential than the negative reality. For instance, if someone says they're vegetarian, instead of saying, why aren't you vegan? Let's talk about why, what made them go vegetarian and how we can help them become vegan. One of the biggest ways we can do this is the way we phrase our open-ended questions. One example of this is instead of asking people if they think we need to eat meat to be healthy, focusing on the negative reality, I like to ask people, do you think we can be healthy without eating animals and focusing on that positive potential? By guiding our conversations towards those positive potentials, people are more likely to be interested in what we have to say and more likely to embrace veganism. One of the most heated debates in the movement is what goals we should be setting. Should we be telling people to reduce or advocating for a clear end goal of veganism? Behavioral psychologists agree that by setting the biggest end goal, we inspire the biggest change possible. This is why I advocate for a clear end goal of veganism. After all, we are talking about behavior change, so why not listen to the behavioral psychologists? Now, this is not to say we shouldn't praise those positive steps along the way. I believe we should. If someone says they're vegetarian, my first reaction is to say, that's great. And then I start talking about the dairy and egg industries. In my experience, it's best to praise those positive steps people are taking and as change ambassadors to set that clear end goal of veganism. If people choose to take steps, that should be up to them. We shouldn't be setting those smaller goals because it's not the most effective as the psychologists have taught us. And it sends a diluted message that it's okay to use animals some of the time when it's not. This is good to reiterate through our conversations. 
Nice work, we've made it to the last video of the psychology section. I'm psyched up. Are you psyched up? For this last video, I'd like to talk about the method over the message. Wait, the method over the message. The, the method over the me Come on guys, come on. The method over the message. Now in a few weeks, perhaps even a few days, you might completely forget what this video is about, but hopefully you remembered we were having some fun. It's the same with our interactions. If we can have conversations with people where they feel good, they're more likely to revisit veganism with other people in their lives and within themselves. That's why the way we say things is sometimes more important than what is said. This is good to keep in mind throughout our interactions. I hope you've enjoyed these short videos highlighting the key concepts I've taken from psychology. Now let's put into practice. I'll see you in the strategy section.